Much of the creativity in these books appears to be used up on the names of the characters, folks like Sinara and Davina and Bronwyn. Less effort seems to have been expended on the titles, Longing Unveiled or Love Forever. Here's Nightline correspondent Hughes Rudd with some of the elements that sell these books. Romance can take you many places, but only so far. Beautiful as it is, it has limits. But desire starts where romance leaves off. And... Now, obviously, those people are not trying to sell you Preparation H. No, that's a commercial for a romance novel. And romance novels are the hottest thing in publishing these days. The world of fantasy, not reality. Paris Afton Bonds, Jude Devereaux, Janet Summer, the stars in the multi-million seller world of the romance novel. Dozens of publishers are mining this mother load, and business is getting better all the time. American women have developed a passion for these paperback book versions of the old love story magazine or true romances, and they can't seem to get enough of them. I think what everybody likes is, gosh, I wish that would happen to me. It's strictly uh, escape reading, that's all. It's uh, kind of like reading fairy tales when you're a youngster. They're full of things that you would love to have happen to you, but you know that they won't. Most romance novels are written to a pretty strict formula determined by market research. Well, what does make a good heroine and a bad hero? Um, a good heroine is someone that, the, as I said before, the readers can identify with. She should be not too attractive, um, but somebody who has um, a good education, who is interested in her life, life around her and people around her, and who is looking for an added element in her life, who is looking to fall in love and to give herself to someone else as, as having them give themselves to her. Uh, for the hero, a bad hero is somebody who is not looking for one woman. A bad hero would be a man who's married. A bad hero would be somebody who is just, just playing around. So the hero is, is one of the more important elements in a romance. But it's not just what's in the book. The cover is as important as the content. If the man is merely holding the woman on the shoulders and he's behind her, it means that the book is sort of mild. Cleavage does not mean that it's a sexy book. It's the intent. It's what's happening between the man and the woman that makes it a sexy book. And when women look at this, they know that this is the kind of book that I want to buy because it's sort of bland and mild. Or I'd rather buy this one right now because this is very, very sexy. Colors have a great deal to do with it also. If the colors are intense, reds, purples, plums it's very sexy if the colors get pale or pastels pinks lavenders it's milder rosemary rogers has sold 30 million copies of her books she's from ceylon she says she's big on research digging through all sorts of reference works before she starts to create but then it's fantasy time i play what if games i watch people and then I make up stories about them. What is fiction for? It's escapism. For a little while, we live in another world. Now, in case there are any heavy literary critics out there about to have apoplexy, you have to remember that what we're looking at here is not supposed to be great art. It's money, lots of money. These products have about as much to do with classical literature as Big Macs have to do with three-star French cooking. But, of course, not everybody likes rich, sophisticated food. So, if William Faulkner or Ernest Hemingway gives you heartburn, then these books could just be your meat. Hughes Red for Nightline in Washington. When we return, we'll talk live with two women who make their living off romance novels and, understandably, think there's more to the genre than titillating trash. And later, I look at some of the historic accomplishments this week aboard the space shuttle Challenger. Our affiliate KNBC in Kansas City is one of the nation's leading writers of romance novels, Janet Daly, described by her publishers as the number one author in the United States and the fifth best-selling author in the world. And from our affiliate KTRK in Houston, Vivian Stevens, founder of the Romance Writers Association and editorial director of Harlequin Books, American Romances Division. All right, Ms. Stevens, I am tired of this nightline nonsense. I want to make big bucks. I understand there is a formula of sorts, maybe more than one, for writing this kind of novel. Tell me what it is. 
Okay, there are several formulas, but the formula for the Harlequin American romances is very simple. It's fantasy within the realm of reality, which means that the average American woman can write about herself and think about the things that she would like to happen to her that is within the realm of reality. So, uh, it, I mean, is it not a good idea to put it back in the 15th century or to be talking about medieval times? Oh, no, no, no. You can do that, but you're not writing a contemporary romance. That's a historical. If you're writing contemporary, you're writing about right now. What you want to see happen to you right now. And it's got to be within reach, but not too close. That is what the new line is all about, yes. Yeah. Because for the average American writer and the reader, She's lived through the sexual revolution. She's lived through the women's movement. So therefore, she knows the things that she can get. And uh, I see no reason why she can't have everything. Now, how torrid should I make this? Should I, should I... Uh... Well, you have to be realistic. You see, because we've lived through the sexual revolution, we are very sensuous. We're very sensuous beings. So um, it is sort of necessary to not stop at the bedroom door. You don't have to be very descriptive, but you cannot fool your audience, you see. Uh, you spoke a moment ago about women. Don't, don't we, I, I realize there are some men who write these things, but don't we read them? I hope you do. I hope you do, because if you'd like to know what American women want, it's all in the book. <laughs> I think you've just increased your sales by a little bit. I hope so. Janet, but, uh, well, go ahead. You were about to make it. No, point. I was about to say, we do have men who read the books, but they are sort of closet readers at the moment. All right. Janet Daly, uh, you are one of the most successful writers in this business. You know the formula. You could probably do it off the top of your head. Indeed, we're going to ask you to do it. Give, you're, you're, you're just about to write a new one of these. Give us a, give us an opening. It, it was a dark and stormy night. Ah, uh, no, usually it's something like uh, the sun was hot on the Arizona desert, creating heat waves, etc., etc. You would probably start it in some way that you're going to grab the reader's sensual level. In other words, you're going to appeal to the senses, the touch, the feel, the smell, the, the taste of what it was like heat at is, that point. Heat is good. Pardon? I say heat is good. Heat is good, yes. Heat is good sometimes sometimes you want the opposite effect and you want cold and icy it depends on the mood you want to start out with you know if you start out hot you've got your work cut out for you because you're gonna have to keep it hot all the way through the book all right uh, forgive me I don't mean this to be an offensive question you are obviously an extremely successful writer you think you're a good writer yes I do I honestly do in my literary genre I am a very good writer the fact that I've sold uh, 95 million copies worldwide you know that in itself 98 countries 19 languages it's, a, it's proof that this type of genre is a highly popular genre, and the good writers are the writers that are bought frequently. Uh, it's a case of quality, not quantity. And, uh, yeah, I think I am a very good writer. How many books have you written? I've written 79. I have to count. I'm sorry. 79? Yes. And, and when did you begin? Uh, I'm a newcomer. I just started in 1976. Harlequin Furnit published my first book. So you knock out more than, more than 10 of these babies a year. Well, I did for a while. I've slowed down. I'm only doing about two a year now. Um, I mean, cutting back. Uh, again, uh, uh, that it does raise certain questions about, I mean, you're either an extraordinarily, well, you're obviously a prolific writer, but how can you get quality in when you're turning them out that fast? I mean, Well, I've, I've never quite understood the equation of quality and quantity. You take somebody like Jack London, he was an absolute factory, or Balzac, or Edgar Allan Poe. I, Heaven's Nightline is a factory. You churn out something every night, but your program is quality still. Oh, listen, so how I don't can I say anything that. nasty about you after that? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me go back to Vivian Stevens for a moment. Tell me a little more about the industry. Uh, I, I said, uh, because someone handed me the information at the top of this program, that uh, the industry as a whole earns about half a billion dollars a year. Is, is that about right? Is that worldwide or here in the United States? I can't hear you right now, but I think I can answer your question. Um, that's, that's the they way do it usually a is. lot of books. <laughs> Last year, Harlequin did 200 million books. Um, that's a lot. Uh, I think that women are looking for a certain kind of entertainment. So therefore, they are repeaters. They go back every month to buy books. 
I'm sorry, I can't hear you at all right Well, that's now. all right. I okay. wasn't saying anything. Oh, no, 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 right. no. Okay. All right. <laughs> all I right. found well, you. I'll tell you what. You. We're going to take a break. We're going to make sure you can hear me and I can hear you. And when we return, we'll be joined in our discussion by a college English professor who's made a study of romance novels throughout the years and thinks we've hit rock bottom. In Pittsburgh is Dr. Patricia Lamb, an associate professor of English at Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. She has made a study of romance literature from medieval times to the present, and you find the present what? I find the present romance novel a most pernicious influence on the life of women. Why is that? Because I think they, um, they're written to women, for the most part, who are stuck in dreary marriages, in unsatisfying lives, Women are sold, for the most part, women are sold on romantic love and courtship as just about the only adventure that they can reasonably expect life to offer them. Well, what's wrong with that? Because there are a lot of adventures. Your next segment, you're going to show Sally Ride coming down. And yeah, well, she's got, she's got something else to do with her time. She doesn't, she doesn't have to read these, although for all I know, she does. Uh, maybe why, she does, maybe she doesn't. If I mean, Sally, you know, folks, folks spend an awful lot of time watching soap operas on television, too. Certainly not the high-class drama, but an awful lot of people watch it. If Sally Ride reads them, it's for escape and fantasy, against which I have absolutely nothing. I also have absolutely nothing against schlock and trash. I love it myself. But I think these particular novels because of the message, because of the needs out of which they are arising and the needs that they fill. These particular novels, as I said before, I think they, they uh, are a really pernicious influence. And I think they're a kind of Valium of the mind or Valium of the emotions for women. And unlike Valium, they are truly addictive. And uh, I, I think they, they help to maintain the status quo in which a woman, as I said, has only one adventure in life offered to her, quote unquote, and that is courtship and marriage. And through these books, women whose only life is, whose only identity is that of her man. She doesn't have a self-identity of her own. She is Mr. Him. Uh, through these books, she can reenact and relive the courtship and the romance over and over and over again. All right, Janet Daly, you've been bravely smiling throughout all of this. You can you can act back if you want. <laughs> No, I really don't think she's read recently uh, the novels that are out because most all of my heroines have all been uh, career type of women. They've been camera operators or they have been actually not an astronaut, but that's, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that's not true. And Could be number 80, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Why not? It's a great idea. Four, four men and one woman up in, up in the space shuttle. It's a great romantic beginning. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> but it's... it's that isn't quite the point, and I think the point that she is making is one that really needs to be addressed, and that is the fact that this is some sort of bad influence on the modern woman of today. And I think that's totally false. In the first place, these books are escape. They are fantasy. They are pure entertainment. That's their only purpose in being. And any other use is, is or any other claim is ridiculous. But Go to ahead. say that modern woman is is going to believe this and expect this out of her life is saying that modern woman is stupid that she's ignorant it insults our own sex and i think that's where you're wrong Go i ahead, think Dr. these women are intelligent but one of the women interviewed in the segment just before this said i wish these things could happen to me i think women reading these for the most part not women in professions and so on but women who have chosen to be homemakers uh, and are not satisfied with that but really can't leave it because the culture tells them this is how they are supposed to structure their lives. This is what society and their parents and the church and so on have always told them to do. I think these women truly read these, not as myth, not as fantasy, yes, escape, but as a possible reality. This is a reality that's not going to be fulfilled in 10 million years. All right, Vivian, we want it anyway. Vivian Stevens, let's get you back in. Uh, I, I have moment. to uh, say to Dr. Lamb, I don't agree with her. The, the average woman is not stupid. I mean, she I knows... She knows what is entertainment, and she knows what is reality, and she's usually fairly happy with her own life. But she does seem to be popping these books rather like Valium pills. Is she, yes, that's very true. And if the books inform, then that's an added attraction. But um, you have to remember this. Women don't buy anything that they don't want. And these are repeat customers. They buy them every month, but they go on with their regular lives. It does not interrupt the daily life of the average American woman. 
All right. I thank all of you very much. I'm afraid we've got to bring this fascinating conversation to a conclusion. Thanks.